What is up, generals? Welcome to Ultimate General Civil War, uh, which should probably not be a welcome to because usually I say we're back with, but this is a new series and I want to add, um, I'm using um, JNP's Rebalance mod, uh, thanks to Panacrout. Uh, so I want to just flag that their newest version, which will be posted either um, on or about 13 January, uh, give or take a day or two on the Game Labs forums and also on the subreddit um, is here. So I have fiddled around a little bit um, in version 1.3. So I'm fresh to 1.4. Um, and the takeaway for me was that the combat, the flow of the, of the individual levels was so much slower uh, that live commentary would probably drag. And, and uh, even side missions were, you know, an hour uh, plus. So you guys don't want to see that kind of length out of the content. So what I'm going to do is I'll probably do as much of this series as we go. So if we hit a brick wall, you know, at like, I don't know, Antietam or something. I'll just call it. Um, we have experienced the mod. Uh, this series is as much about learning about what the mod looks like and plays like because we can read patch notes. We can read um, features of the mod. We can look at screenshots, but nothing really, really calls out what that play experience looks like, like seeing it in action. Um so I've tried to record an episode for the, the CSIA tutorial and uh, it, it the initial play of the game moves so slowly that I struggle to think of what that would look like minus a lot of editing. Uh, so instead, we'll just jump in. Um, the UI experience will be the same throughout the entire way, but things look a little bit different in terms of what they do. And the tooltip doesn't really call out kind of what these things, you know, what they do uh, at this level. So we got to figure out about how we want to kind of approach everything. Um, first of all, let's just click through and get to, it doesn't really matter, get to this screen and take a look at what, what works a little bit differently. So politics works more or less the same as always, but you'll notice... Um, the number here is smaller. I think income at this point would be plus 15, I'm pretty sure. So I think it's three points per tick, I want to say. Uh, economy is the same. Um, gives you a, a scaling discount. And that's important because the cost of weapons has gone up pretty significantly, and so you can't ignore economy. Um, or if you, it, rather I should say, ignore economy at your peril. Um, recon as well uh, carries the same information as it would have uh, in the battle at, at four, you get that little bar and everything else. Uh, additionally, every additional point of recon beyond one, or beyond zero, I guess, gives you a scaling or flat 20 spotting to every unit in the army, which can be presumably um, multiplied by some of the perks that recon units can take. Uh, logistics is important for a number of reasons. Let's see if there's a pop-up. No, logistics, logistics is important for a number of reasons. Aside from the obvi the the vanilla effect with regard to uh, your in battle ammunition, it also adds a, a positive modifier to what's available in the in game store. Uh, so, with logistics zero, you might see say a thousand um, Harper's Ferries or something to be bought in the armory, and with logistics one, you would see you know I don't know. 1250 or something and then two you'd see 1500 etc so forth and so on um the effect is um finger quotes here half strength so it's not quite as powerful for artillery and that just means that you know it's, it's going to prevent us from stockpiling armor or yeah uh artillery uh training is cool training gives you not in addition to let's see da, 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 in addition to the discount for veterans it also gives you a bonus to the base stats on recruits um i think it's like two per tick i want to say so that's really cool it's a good way to get like if, if you get max training in the union you're recruiting confederate you're recruiting confederate recruits at that point um by the time they become uh, you know, you're, you have training 10. 
Anyway, um, so normally what I would do is I'd say this and then this and then probably that for the Confederacy. But that's what I did in vanilla. And the stats all do different things now, but I'm not sure kind of what the way to, like how to lead in because I feel like logistics is pretty important. Recon is like a nice to have. It's nice to have to know to where we are in terms of the manpower and how we need to behave. I still think that that's probably the way to go. Uh, that wouldn't hurt either, I suppose. Nope. So yeah, I guess I guess I go with my vanilla my vanilla build. Um, Rebel fiasco. So we go into the game with Economy 3, AO1, Logistics 2, Recon 4. We're going to need to bump AO to 1, or sorry, to 2 by uh, uh, first bull run. Um, and then we're going to need to get it up to like like 5 or something for Shiloh. It, like it's It's probably the focus, the stat we're going to focus on the most in the opening game. And that's going to be a real pain in the ass. It's going to make... Uh, equipping our army difficult so these points here are really important because we need them to get to make guns even remotely bearable in terms of the expense they are very expensive um like i said though the, the combat itself the battle is uh slow so uh yeah without further ado um i will be back in a couple seconds as far as the audio is concerned and i'll see you then fiasco signing out Um, okay, so, uh, here we are, uh, in, in the actual game. This is what you guys probably clicked on this video for. Um, the mission tutorial or the mission, uh, briefing is more or less the same. Hey, we got to take the fort and reinforcements are coming along this road, you know, um, uh, gain ground before the fort's heavily reinforced because those two <clears throat> additional brigades will really kind of screw your shit up. So the first thing you want to do is you want to take a look at, Notice the perks and notice the um, the layout of the weapons. And I talk about this a bit more later on. Um, but the discipline perk has been replaced with marching drill, which gives you an increase to your unit movement speed as well as um, your charge damage. And uh, it's a shame that I didn't get kind of both perks here because I wanted to also show off what firing drill does or musketry drill or something like that. Um, and you can see the market difference in terms of performance between non um oh and then the next thing is that there's hexamers broken off into two different brigades so i asked panda crowd about this because i didn't understand what was triggering the behavior of the unit splitting and evidently there's this mechanic in the mod called the it's like, like a variability feature um and on occasion it can split some of these units and it will change up uh, it'll change up a lot of like how these missions flow and it can be good and bad, obviously. Um, cause right now it's, you know, I've got allied units to rely on, but that won't be the case, um, all the time. So, uh, my understanding of how the variability mechanic works and please panic out in the comments, you know, set me straight. Um, on occasion, the game may split AI controlled units and, and just double them basically. Um, so in this instance, I have two hex hammers, uh, and I think later on I get like two of some of the other brigades. Um, but that happens for the AI too. Uh, when I was playtesting at Bull Run, I got you know those big brigades that are like twenty four hundred men or whatever that come across that across the bridge after you're done holding um, the hill, Henry Hill. Um, they doubled those, so there was you know suddenly five thousand Union Union infantry right across this this bridge. Uh, but yeah, the speed here is doubled up. This whole thing's going to be, uh, double time. And I say that it's double time, but like watch the flow of everything. You wouldn't know. Like it almost looks like I'm playing on normal speed or possibly even a little bit slow-mo. Um, there are perks that govern the speed of a lot of these units and without the perks, you know, Panda Crowd's made a comment, perks pretty much rule the battlefield and he is dead right. Um... And that makes me worried from the purposes of balance because I'm sure the perks that the AI get 
are completely random. And um, these perks seem to have a pretty, like, implied chain with them. And we'll get to that in the post-battle analysis. There's, I have the opportunity to show uh, the artillery and infantry perks, and I'll obviously work on trying to get cav uh, and skirmishers up to the point where I can show those perks too um, and talk about them and see what I think that they, they might kind of imply. But there's, a, there's a, an implied progression along the perk chain. Uh, and the AI presumably will have them mostly chosen at random. Uh, I find it interesting or noteworthy that the infantry brigades in the vanilla game for me are around 800 and here they're closer to 1400, but the cavalry is the same size at 220 and change. 220 and change versus an 800 man brigade is reasonable, especially if you charge it while it's running away here. The Union size brigades are the same size, but the Confederates are, and this might, this might be a balanced pass to make this mission a little more bearable, I suppose. Um, I'm not really sure. I end up getting Crocker wiped over the course of this battle, but he doesn't carry forward in the next battle anyway. Uh, the next, so that's, uh, the, the perks are kind of one thing. Both of my infantry brigades that spawn here have perks that make them move faster and suggest heavily that I should be trying to get into melee because they give me a plus 50% bonus on charge damage, which is useful. Um, additionally, note that they both, I don't think I have a chance to look at it, or if I do, I forget, but everyone here has spawned in with... Uh, rifled muskets. So both versions of Hexhammer are using the um, 1841 Mississippi, and uh, I think Siegfried has the MJ and G, and the other guy whose name I Kemper I think has uh, the Springfield 1855. Um, their performance characteristics are differentiated. They they really are. Uh, the 1855 has this great. I'll talk about it a bit post battle because I, I think it took me a minute to figure out kind of what the what the breakpoints were on some of these rifles, but now I kind of get it. I think the fifty five has got a high rate of fire, but it's got a pretty rough drop off in terms of its damage accuracy at long range, whereas the forty one remains accurate out to max range within reason. It's better obviously up close, but it works at range. Um, now, having said that, notice that Hexamer is a non perked unit and just i mean watch how poorly they shoot um you know reliance on non-perked units i think is going to be a mistake uh and this might be the sort of thing where the balance highly encourages you to take a look at um an elite army because elite armies are probably going to vastly outperform um, their equivalents. Additionally, melee is very, very powerful in the early game. Um, and uh, that in to their defense, they talk about this in the patch notes. So you should, you should be aware of that, that melee is going to be more important than musketry early on. And then that might change um, <clears throat> as the game continues. Uh, it appears that Chetlin has a split into two units. So there's there the AI gets it too. It's not just me. Um, but I, I rapidly get frustrated here as a player. Just, you know, I, I should be gunning this unit down and I'm not. So I eventually I, I make the potentially boneheaded decision to charge uh, Second Ohio with two unperched brigades relying largely on weight of numbers um, rather than anything else. Crocker here is making mincemeat of the skirmishers and then joins charging in at uh second ohio and at this point i'm convinced they should surrender you know uh, or something and then we go on this sort of vaudevillian chase trying to run them down um but it's it's as a play note it's incredibly frustrating uh to be point blank with these muskets and see just how shitty they are at shooting it's wild now it's not like I, I say that, like it's frustrating coming from the vanilla play experience where I could use unperked units and be mostly fine. Um, but I think everything that I've read about the historical era is that like fresh recruits were just as often as not firing their muskets up into the air or loading them incorrectly, or you know that they had a hard time getting them to fight properly. So this might be an accurate representation of that. Um, real world issue 
that commanders at the time had to wrestle with. Um, <clears throat> and it may be an excellent kind of limiter on growing your army very large because by the very nature of getting it bigger and bigger like that, you're going to have, you're going to have to bring in more and more recruits. Um, and then that will dilute the quality of your army and dilute access to perks. But perks are like, I consider them a nice to have in the vanilla game. Like perks are great. I don't mind them. I'm not going to say no, but I think perks feel just mandatory to even be competent. Um, <clears throat> the next thing I want to call attention to is watch Canfield Brigade number two. So Canfield, look at all those dead bodies under him. He took one casualty. Look at all those bodies. And look at his casualty count, 581. He took one loss. He came into this battle with 832. He's gotten shot once. There's Canfield Brigade number one to give you an idea. Canfield two is a copy pasta of Brigade two. So there's this sea of gray on the ground from one single loss. And it's it's probably because Canfield should have spawned into the battlefield at 1400 with everybody else, like Bernie and his peers. But because of the variability thing kicked in and split them, um, I'm guessing it's treated at the game as like, well, Canfield spawned into the map at 1500 and now all of a sudden he's on to eight and change. You know, what else could it have been except for casualties? And the game can't parse, I'm guessing, where those casualties would have come from. So it just the first time the unit takes casualties, boop, it just drops them on the ground there. So that's my guess. Don't, I mean, I'm, I'm, I haven't looked at the LUAs or the code behind this game, but that's, that seems a pretty solid guesstimate as to what's happened. So Crocker's over there trying to run down um, the second Ohio. Uh, he's rapidly exhausting himself in the process. Another thing, units that don't have the stamina perk leveled up tire themselves out very quickly. Um, so that's something else you're going to want to take a look at is as far as I could tell, there weren't any perks that leveled stamina, which makes sense because you can just level stamina on the battlefield. Um, it's never a stat I ever cared about in the base game. It's just kind of, it was there. Uh, but I think you, you definitely need to take it into account and be considerate of if you have a moment and you're on the battlefield, you're waiting for the enemy to show up or whatever, shuffle your dudes around. You know, if there's a segment of the battlefield that's quiet, go for a walk. March your troops because you don't have any other opportunity to do this out of battle. You can't you can't do like like Stonewall Jackson's infamous for training his men and these grueling foot marches and whatnot, and they hated it. But then when it came time to fight, um they rapidly began to appreciate, you know, the import of what Stonewall was teaching them. So, um, I also get frustrated here watching my two uh, brigades, Kemper and Siegfried, trade blows with this one Union brigade that's half their strength. And they've inflicted, you know, together between the two of them, like 112 shooting kills. It's, it's, it's nuts. So I'm like, okay, this is dumb. Um, we outnumber him three to one. Let's just go over, let's go over there and beat his face in with the back of a, back of a musket. And uh, as you may expect, that's pretty effective because their incoming fire, like they try and shoot me on the way in. No, they don't have any perks. They try and shoot me on the way in and it does nothing. Um, and so I, <clears throat> excuse me, I give them one quick volley and then I launch my dudes in there. And I'm still trying to run down second Ohio because I just don't want this unit in my backfield screwing my plans up. Watch how quickly things fall apart for third Ohio. That's nuts. That's crazy pants right there. Insanity. It's a shame again that I don't get them because they're to the point now where I feel like they should be, they should be surrendering uh, and they're not. And so uh, I pull Hexmer back. They, they, J and P very cleanly state don't overuse your troops. Don't overuse your troops. Rest them, rest them, rest them. Stamina or exhaustion carries huge performance modifiers or per, uh, debuffs or whatever. Um, and it's absolutely the case. I can't rely on Hexamer 1 or 2 to do anything of worth when they're exhausted like this. Um, however, I get I jump the gun because the, the play is so slow at this point that I'm kind of like, let's do stuff and see what we can't do. Um, I realize that the 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 fort is severely undermanned and I've got an extra brigade here from Canfield splitting into two. So I think, Oh, why don't I go ahead and see if I can't take the fort while these other units are, are mopping up second and third Ohio. This is a mistake. 
You'll see why, but this is a mistake. Also note that they're starting batteries, so the game spawns them with two. They, they, they spawned um, a copy of one of the batteries, so now they have three batteries of artillery. Uh, and we'll get to we'll get to artillery in a second here, but I, I feel um, that artillery might be benefiting from a balance pass, or early game artillery may, may benefit from a balance pass. It, I think artillery has an outsized impact on the battlefield, and that may be an indirect effect of musketry being so shit um, that artillery needs... You know, our, our artillery is not actually overperforming. It's just that musketry is so strongly underperforming that it's the only thing killing anybody at range. Um, additionally, again, I'd love to be able to show you a um, a, uh, a, a a unit perked for musketry, and there I just don't have any right now. Everything everything that game came in this game in this in this map has spawned in with the. Um, maneuver slash melee perk. So I, it to a degree does dictate my um, my strategy. When I would generally prefer to be shooting things, um, you just can't. Secondly, or additionally, let's go ahead and note the fact that I captured an artillery unit. There's 55 members of Battery B that have surrendered. Um, you know, so that's, that's cool. Uh, but yeah, so this is why you can't just charge into that fort willy-nilly. They've got three batteries of artillery who just blast the fuck out of everything. Like, artillery is insanely powerful, and musketry does exactly jack fucking all. Um, your dudes may as well be spitting at them with, like, pea shooters or something. Uh, we've got 150 dudes standing down here. Maybe it's 80. Yeah, it's 80. 180 dudes standing down here. I've got two 1,500-man brigades unloading into this guy. He's in the open, and he's fine. Nope, it's 50. Actually, it's 145 now. Again, I get bored and frustrated. I charge because uh, I want them gone. I want I want them gone. And my guys have enough stamina because they've out, they've the Confederate troops spawn in with with their stamina stat in the mid 30s. So that's the difference between Hexamer with a stamina of like six, uh, and you know Bernie Canfield, Allen, and my my two units, Kemper and Siegfried, all have the the traditional baseline Confederate stats. Um, of of whatever, and I, I'm 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 imagining that Hexamer's stats are so hot garbage because he's supposed to be a skirmisher unit, um, and J and P have transitioned him into a traditional infantry unit, um, and then for one reason or another, his uh, his stats didn't get confederated, confederated, I guess, uh, or alternatively, um, it's a balance thing, and they're just trying to keep like they're trying to illustrate, you know what what garbage infantry can be if you don't perk it and level it up and everything else. Um, I run into the same, I ran into the same issue during my test playthrough out to bulls run. All of the, all of the units that the game spawns you with, um, or the allied units in bull run are also, you know, what I would classify as ultra shit tier. Their stats are like fives and seven and they're just, uh, it's <laughs> that battle is rough. Um, well, it was when I played it before. Uh, we'll see. Maybe I've figured a thing or two out here. I've realized that gunnery can't can't be the end all be all. Uh, again, so I've got what just shy of three thousand men dedicated to running down two hundred because I just want them gone. It's, it's amazing how much work this takes to get these guys dead. Uh, but I've realized the foolishness of my ways. I pull my uh, secondary units back to rest up over here, recover their morale um we'll take care of second ohio here just look at how atrocious this musketry is look at this this is ridiculous now part of it's that hexamer one and two were exhausted okay fine but that is nuts we are that terrible at shooting a gun um it's crazy man. it's crazy so we eventually managed to run second ohio down whatever and then i'll pull um, first division basically up against this tree line, uh, right around where I'm had, the, I'm having them move now. They're going to rest up. Um, and once they're at full, I'm going to send them in there, um, to take the fort and the thought process, the, the conceptualization of the operation will be that I'll send Hexamer one and two in, um, as bullet sponges because they're unperked and they're shit and they're garbage and they won't kill anything anyway. So what does it matter? And then my troops, the ones that actually carry through to the next battle, which is to say Kemper and Siegfried, they'll come by and Hexamer, like right on his ass, 
Um, and because they have that melee perk and the speed, I should be able to time it so that Hexamer and Siegfried and Kemper and Hexamer all hit at the same time. Um, <clears throat> Hexamer catches the bullets on the way in, and then Siegfried, you know, provides the killing club blow. So we're going to pincher the fort um, with uh, Canfield 1 and 2, Bernie and Allen on the one side, and then the first division on the other. Uh, that all goes really well. And I realized that I've got two hours, you know, so the, the developers have expanded the timelines for these missions as well. You have more time to play with. You've got um, looser timings on some of these offensive battles, comma, that can bite you in the ass for some of the defensive battles as well. So be ready for that too. Um, so I preemptively give the order here. Uh, second division should probably hold up and I do realize that they're going to get there first and then I don't want them. We're just going to have basically a repeat of what happened earlier all over again. So I, I halt them and I wait until the elements of first division get closer. And here's where you can get a great visual reference for the difference in movement speed between a perked and non-perked unit. Watch Kemper and Siegfried and watch Hexamer. Everyone's rested. And look at how much faster like it's visibly identifiable the speed difference um, between these units. It's wild. It's one of the reasons you, you'll see my core, my core uh, rebel fiasco, my core commanders. You'll see who I like the perks I pick, the, the reasons I pick them. You'll see why. Like this is insane. Um, it really means you need to be careful with your perk choices and your. Um, the utilization of non-speeded up units. Um, however, I think what is nifty about that is that you're not locked into a melee tree. Like if you you, you take the, the the speed perk, and again we'll get to this later. If you take the speed perk, you're not locked into a melee tree. There's a, there's a, there's an offensive musketry perk, which could be very util well very well utilized with the speed perk. So the musketry drill is a very attractive perk because it doubles your accuracy um, with the muskets. But speed, man, like all the guns in the world don't mean shit if they're in the wrong place. So um, for the first time ever, there's an actual choice to be made in the um, perks you pick for uh, infantry in Ultimate General because I don't think anybody's ever chosen discipline ever uh, in, the <laughs> in the vanilla game. Um, so we come swarming in here. The infantry that's defending the fort is distracted with first division while second division rushes in. Again, the artillery mauls me on the way in. So I, I chatted with Panacrout. Um, I, tech, I, I, I commented back and forth with Panacrout a bit on Reddit uh, about this. And apparently the, the, the damage curves, the way they exist right now, the six pounder um, vastly outperforms uh some of the other guns in the smoothbore size category. So it's not obviously a counter battery piece, but it's certainly a good infantry support piece. What that means is that he's, he's going to want to do a balance pass through on some of these, some of these pieces of artillery. Um, but until that happens, the, I'll be utilizing six pounders as um, infantry guns at every single opportunity that I have um, because they get, they do some serious work. Again, in my test playthrough out to Bull Run, they were like, usually when the AI spawns in those batteries of six pounders, you're like, cool, go sit in the corner and play with yourself because you're basically useless. And that is not the case uh, <laughs> in, in the rebalance of um, Ultimate General as it currently stands. Six pounders do some nuts on work. So we wrap up the first day. And what's. Um, sad face about this stuff is that the things that spawned in on day one you don't get all of them on day two uh and in my in my earlier playthrough i got lucky in that um bernie here a, one of the units you fight with bernie split so you you start the game and you, you had i had kemper and siegfried and then bernie one and two so i had four brigades defending this fort that was much better in terms of making this first mission a little more bearable um i have tried Panacraut's strategy of abandoning the fort altogether, running your dudes over to the tree line and fighting it out there. That works. 
Um, but it's incredibly messy and it, it, it costs you a lot of casualties because you're, again, you're, du- you're dueling it out at musket range and your dudes are now tired from running over there and, and exhaustion is a serious problem in the rebalance mod. You've got to keep your guys rested. Um, so something Compass would do great because he's so, so, so good about resting his troops that they would be, you know, they'd be like, this is great. Let's do it. Um, and uh, you, you just, oh my goodness, you can't. You can't run over there. You'll lose half your command. Um, so I stick it out in the fort. That This is the second time I've tried playing um, Potomac Fort on the rebalance with Major General. Um, and I, like I know it's passive and kind of boring to hold the fort, but I think this is the way to do it. Now, um, it doesn't mean I can't be a bit proactive, and I am with Crocker and then the elements of 2nd Division you get as reinforcements down the line. I work hard with Crocker and the reinforcements to split the attention of the AI because notice they've got a couple of here, Burnham Brigade 1 and Brigade 2. So this Burnham got doubled up and so did Grant. Look how big Grant, well, Grant's 800 and change too. So there's, the the Union has two extra brigades beyond what they normally would have at this battle. Uh, and I have right now my normal three. Now, as a caveat to that, um, the two batteries you start this battle with are larger. So in the vanilla game, they're both six gun batteries, I think. And here they're both 14 gun batteries. Uh, Frustratingly, they go from being um, six pounders, which normally I would say, oh yeah, get rid of them. Uh, (laughs) But in the the current state of the balance as of version 1.24, six pounders are like on fire. And then um, the three inch ordinance is what they are right now is not wonderful. Uh, (laughs) So it's one instance where I'd actually prefer to downgrade. Uh, So Crocker comes around here and steals the supply wagon and then goes and chases the general around. This ends up biting me in the ass, which is a shame. Um, Chasing the general, that is. But it works out really well in that stealing that supply wagon causes the AI to flip its shit um, and send one, one version, one of the copies of Grant and some skirmishers chasing after that supply wagon. And I, I run them around and I get them exhausted and tired. And, and, and again, if nothing else, that's a thousand men not attacking the fort. Um, I'm also trying to bait the AI into charging me because these fortifications have good melee defense and also canister is lethal even with shitty three inchers. Um, so if it's possible, I like the three inch ordinance even less in the rebalance mod than I do in the vanilla game. Uh, two units charging Bernie, even with the, the melee defense. Look at how just he quickly falls to shit. Uh, so I, I throw Siegfried in there. Siegfried has the melee perk, so I, I utilize that by actually having him charge. And Siegfried just f- freaking murders everything. Um, additionally, with uh, the uh, artillery firing, firing canister into both of those units, they, they both take debilitating casualties and at this point um their offensive has cost them way more than they ever than they, they could have gotten in in it so i'm still chasing the general and i'm still running their supply wagon around trying to distract them and pull forces away from the attack anything i can do essentially to split their attention is is ultimately my objective is keep them focused anywhere but my fort and, and then keep them confused or whatever. Um, this was not my original plan, is to have Canfield and Allen come over here and um, kind of push in the flank. I initially intended them to go support the fort, um, but Terry retreats into Canfield, and then that kind of works out to my favor. Uh, Nicholas, their general, runs over there and captures the supply wagon. That's fine. Um but then he doesn't do anything to defend it. So Grant now, Grant 2 is like, okay, cool. We have our supply wagon back. We're fine. So I just come back with Crocker and take it again. And the AI like is kind of hip to what I got going on, but it doesn't, you know, it can't get there in time to get it. So I sneak in and get it again. <laughs> and then I have the AI or uh, the supply wagon continue to run away. So now not only has Grant taken the bait and now he's like, got to get that supply wagon, but so has Terry. So now there's 2,000 infantry ignoring the fort that they came here to take, <clears throat> trying to chase after the supply wagon. The taking of the supply wagon pays dividends down the line as well because um, pr- 
pretty quickly their stuff runs out of our out of rounds uh and um I mean, you're already seeing it. Like we're barely into this fight. We got three hours left, and their artillery is already running low on ammunition. Uh, that's going to pay great dividends um, from from distracting portions of the force to um, rendering those elements of their force that are are engaged in serious fighting ineffective because they will burn through their supply wagon or their ammunition pretty quick, and there's nothing here to supply them um, with more. So I wait for, here we go to the power of melee. Both Allen and Canfield have the melee charge damage perk. So I wait until the last possible second, and I charge Allen and then Canfield at Schumer, uh, and he just falls to pieces. So, or possibly Shermer, whatever. Uh, we've, the, the, bad, the, pal- the patch notes talk about how effective melee is early on, and I mean, it's you can't argue with the results. So, Watching this, watching me in terms of my my battle plan or battle strategy, it shifts pretty quickly from just kind of watching how just laughably ineffective musketry is, just to the point of being like, why am I even here? Um, I start thinking about, well, you know, okay. So if gunnery is not going to get me anywhere, which it's not, and melee is so effective. Can I use that um, as a strategy? And ultimately the answer is yes, and I get there in a second. You'll see, we come storming out of the fort here, and we you know, wipe a unit and, and ra- run some things away and everything else is great. Coupled with the fact that their units are starting to run out of ammunition, um, it means that the fire on the way in is not very effective or there's a way for us to charge units while they're reloading um, or move in on units while they're reloading, and that works out pretty well too. Uh, But yeah, this is a long fight. It was a long fight. I burned through all of my supply wagon, and it's actually a good thing that I captured the AI supply wagon because I start burning through it too. Um, and I know my intention was to to keep it off the entire battle and be like, great, I've got money to help kind of kickstart the Confederate uh, economy going into this campaign. That was absolutely my objective in in not spending the resources that's in that supply wagon. But I ran out of anything else. I, I, I consume everything that the, the fort has. I consume all of my own supplies. Uh, and so ultimately I run out to the point where I'm like, okay, well, I've got to use something. Uh, and, you know, I, I can't afford to have my cannons at um, out of ammunition. So here's where I talk about trying to split their attention. I eventually push Canfield and Allen. I realize like supporting them, supporting my command from the front probably won't accomplish anything. Because they're in the open, they've got no cover, and we're at the point now where to do anything I need to engage in a melee, but there's still too many Union units, even if they are small, to um, pull off a successful charge that will do anything besides get my command destroyed. So I start trying to wield this small battle force of Allen, Canfield, and Crocker um, around to the extreme Union right. Uh, with an eye on threatening their artillery and forcing them to respond. Additionally, I start dangling the supply wagon out here, hoping that the Union AI takes the bait. Um, And they do a little bit. They launch themselves into a a more aggressive than needed... Excuse me. A more aggressive than needed push on, um, on the fort. And I'm still just trying to bait them into launching a charge. Like that's what that's where I'm going to get the best kills, is either fighting them in the trenches or just at the last second charging out of the trenches. Um, because Panda Krauts turned me on to the fact that there is no wind up time for what this game considers to be a charge bonus or charge damage. And so I'm sitting here like, look, I'd love to shoot, but my units aren't optimized for it. So if that be the case, then what? Um, what do I do? And I, I want to lean into my strengths, and that is melee. Melee is my strength. I am infinitely frustrated that we didn't get Hexamer 
on this map because Hexamer has uh, 1841s and they've got fantastic melee stats. But it is what it is. I'll live. So we keep on shooting. I swap Bernie in for Siegfried and that seems to be the thing that triggers the AI into losing its mind. They go and see red. And it's probably because Bernie's so much smaller than Siegfried. Siegfried's 1,300 guys and the AI's like, we can't charge that. But Bernie's only 800 and so they think we can charge that. And they do. They come screaming in here with Grant 1 and Shermer and um, Brooke. This is exactly what I wanted to be seeing. This is exactly what I wanted them to do. Some crazy kamikaze, not so charge. They come screaming in and we tear them to pieces. They eat canister. They eat point blank musket fire. They eat, you know, the melee from units who are gaining the melee benefit or the melee cover. And now we've encircled their entire force. Now, admittedly, my rear cordon is very weak. Crocker is on the edge of breaking plot twist. He breaks pretty soon. Um, or spoiler alert, he breaks pretty soon. Uh, and Allen and Canfield are both specced for melee in a situation where I can't afford to charge them into melee. So, I mean, it is what it is. But I've successfully drawn enough troops of theirs away from the frontal attack that it allows me to do what I do next, and that's come charging out of my trenches and uh, beat them up. And then I even start wheeling my cannons out because I'm like, hey, if we can use these cannons at canister or, or shell range, we can get some really good work in. Because it turns out the three-inch ordinance has fucking terrible scaling like it's useless at long range holy crap um so you don't want to use that gun at all at a distance and again that might be a thing that needs a balance perk because it's supposed to be historically speaking a weapon that has pretty good like pretty good use at range so just i don't know um i i've, I've read reports that people liked their ordnance and parrot guns because they had um a range advantage over the far more numerically common Confederate Napoleon units. Napoleons are a very good ubiquitous weapon that was apparently used used and thought of as being accurate despite being a smoothbore. Um, in the era, comma, uh, it lacked the ability to accurately shoot at range in the same way that a parrot or a three-inch ordnance could. So the rifled guns did indeed have a range advantage over their smoothbore counterparts. Um but the smooth bores were still generally thought of as being accurate. So what I like about what I'm doing right now is I'm playing to my perks. I'm playing to the fact that my perks demand an aggressive play style and I'm, I'm playing aggressively. And the fact that there is a, there's a, there's a, a, a tangible difference in terms of performance and how they, how they behave and everything else and how they're optimized between units that have different kinds of perks enables and in fact forces um a play style difference uh in 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 your your utilization of the units unfortunately my offensive here stalls because i run out of stamina i run out of steam um but we're still able to inflict some pretty insane losses on the enemy i Watching this now after the fact, I absolutely should have sent Kemper in there to charge both Brooke and Haskell. He totally had it. He has a little over half the stamina left. Um, and I instead opt to uh, morale shock Haskell and then back up, which is the safer, more conservative play, um, but is the far less exciting to watch <laughs> play. Uh, I realize that, however, there's some fault in my plan as uh Shermer now having routed away from his army is wide open to walk into both the supply wagon and also the fort so despite the burn on my exhaustion I run Siegfried back into the trenches uh predominantly just to block his path that's all I'm looking for um Shermer is at roughly a third of the strength that he came into the battlefield with. So, and having lost a melee as a, a couple of uh, one or two melees now, it's likely he's down an officer. So one of the nifty things this game does is if you lose an officer, um, it's, it, it simulates what I've always kind of assumed happens off camera. So what happens when, you know, the Colonel of a regiment, or the lieutenant colonel of a brigade or regiment goes down, his major takes over. It's what an executive officer is there for. Um, 
So that's exactly what happens here. If let's say you have one of these brigades commanded by a colonel and the colonel dies, um, a lieutenant colonel takes his position because that's what the executive officer would do. It's the chain of command. If you lose a link at the top, you just go to the next lowest chain uh, or a link on the chain. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. So the game actually gives you an officer. So losing an officer isn't this crushing thing like it is in the vanilla game, but it's still a problem um, because uh, the penalties for being too low rank to command a unit are pretty severe. Like I've tried to put majors in units and they, the game is just kind of like, ah, 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 <laughs> he didn't say the magic word. Um, you know, no, basically. So at this point in time, I realize I'm pretty overextended and the AI still has enough brigades to seriously threaten my position and I'm in, I'm in danger of being overrun. Um, so I pull myself back into my fort, um, happy in the casualties that I've inflicted, pull myself back into the fort. And then I start retreating with Alan and uh, I guess just Alan who's by himself now because Canfield's actually joined the main command, the main body. Um, so Can so Alan is now kind of acting as the distracting element that Crocker would have been fulfilling, but Crocker's, you know, shattered. Um, Alan is now pulling troops away from the main body. I think two brigades he keeps busy. So two brigades are not attacking the fort while the remainder of my troops return to the fort and rest up because they're all exhausted, obviously, um, from the attack. And that's fine. You know, it's, it's them being tired is okay. Them fighting from a stable position gives them a chance to rest. It's not nearly as fast as if they weren't in combat, but they're still resting. And, um, so we, 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 we do that. We, we chill out and, um, recover our stamina and everything else. I, I force Canfield to run to get back in the fort. And now I've got four brigades defending my fortress and two batteries of artillery and a lot of, in, a lot of union units are on the edge of shattering. And so now I start having the artillery focus fire on units who I think are on the cusp. So there's that skirmish unit battle. He's got 60 guys left. He's got to be on the cusp. You know, that's the thought process. So I put all of my fire into him, even though there are better targets um, there are better or more efficient targets nearby. I want to shatter whole units. That particular portion of my overall battlefield strategy probably won't shift from this game is that shattering whole units or capturing, ideally capturing whole units is still the name of the game. Um, attritioning sandpaper is what I called it in the um, Richmond video, and I think that's still the appropriate term. Sandpaper across the entire army is something you need to do. You need to attrit units down to the point where they're effectively unable to, or they're ineffective in their resistance of stopping your, um, your plans, comma, shattering entire units denies the enemy the ability to even tenuously hold portions of the battlefield. Uh, and that's the kind of thing you need to be doing if you want to, um, really go on the offensive, especially in a battle like this where you're so strongly outnumbered initially and all of the battlefield initiative sits in the AI's um, control. So we work on shattering Burnham 2. And that takes however long it takes. And then we're going to change our fire to somebody else and try and shatter them. And, you know, that's that's basically the, the battle plan for the rest of the map. Eventually, I do come out of the trenches again once my guys are rested up enough. Uh, and I continue to just continuously mash the F button on, on Alan. I'm continuously trying to fall him back because I'm trying to pull, uh, it looks like Terry... At least Terry and, and one other brigade are trying to chase Alan, chase Alan down. And that's perfect. That's fine. I don't care. I, I get that he's tired. That's also why I'm trying to pull Alan back. But there's at least a thousand soldiers chasing Alan down who are not, again, attacking the fort. That's good and bad, obviously. It's bad because I'd prefer to be engaging units in melee and getting the insane kill ratios I'm getting in melee at this stage of the campaign. But it's also good because it's 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 forcing the AI to, um, you know, slow down and sit sit in in shell range of my cannons, and they don't appear to. Oh, they're wheeling their guns up now, but their guns appear to be nearly out of ammunition. So the the artillery fire they're sending my way is not very effective. Um, side note. 
I don't know how many kills the gunboats got, but they didn't seem to do very much. So the gunboats aren't mega effective, thank goodness. Uh, because having them blasting my back at my ass the entire battle would not be great. So, um, yeah, I think we, I think uh, either a unit ran away or, or shattered there. I finally get Alan away and have him just rest up. And I think Alan spends the rest of the battle just chilling there. Because I see we've got 25 minutes, 28 minutes left. And um, why? You know, why why get him back out there? With the exception of the fact that, again, I don't keep him. So casualties that he suffers don't really matter. Um, so the artillery works on shattering units and everything else. Um, okay, so individual things that I pulled out. Let's do a, an, an overview. Musketry in the early game is atrocious. Like, wow. Feels bad, man, dot JPG. Bad. Especially in units that aren't perked for it. And that's one of the things I'd love to be able to show you in this video, and I will in Newport News because I've got a unit with the perk, um, is the performance difference between a unit properly spec'd for musketry and a unit not spec'd for musketry. It is night and day the kill ratios that musket units get versus um, non-optimized musket units in terms of the utilization of their musketry. So um, from a balance perspective, I'd like to see probably the baseline musketry performance for infantry tick up just a little bit. Um, and, and you can neuter the performance of some of the perks uh, if you need to. The perks should be important, but I don't know if they should be this important. Um, so I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Uh, I'll withhold my judgment because I've played exactly four missions and one of them I've played twice. <laughs> so I don't know if that makes me a really qualified judge of the balance pass yet. But I got to say, in terms of a play experience, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to have 3,000 men shooting at 150 and not being able to kill them um, and then have melee just that one-sided. When you see I, I, I yank Siegfried out of the fortifications and he just evaporates a unit. Um so, uh, also some finesse on the weapons, you know, balance patches on some of the cannons and what kind of thing like that. Uh, I realize that they give me the opportunity to fight this out. So in the base game, once the timer reaches zero, that's it, you're done. And they give me the option to run the enemy down here. So you better believe, um, I assess the battlefield, I look at my units and I think we can do this. You had better believe I'm going to get every kill I can. Um... So I pull Siegfried over here to support Alan. Uh, and then I'm going to do the same plan that I did before when I was doing it with Canfield. Is essentially, I'm going to fix them to the front because, hey, they're really focused on taking that flag or the, the center of my base. And then I'm going to have my dudes push in their flank. And we're going to charge somebody and we're going to ultimately sally out of the fort and get our kills in melee. Uh, it goes great. I think we end up capturing both batteries. Um, and, you know, it just... The early game, the way that the, especially with the way the perks have randomly fallen in my favor, the, the early game incredibly favors um, aggression and melee and all of those things. And I would imagine that that's also vaguely historically accurate because um, I think one of the things that makes us believe that the, you know, the rebels had these super soldiers in their lines when performance characteristics in terms of accuracy and everything else don't typically bear that out. Um, if you, you look at the statistics in terms of the individual units or individual soldiers, they might be a bit more willing and able to, to, to survive the predations of, um, the campaign trail, but they didn't perform statistically significantly better than their union counterpart with the exception of bravado Confederate units because of the lack of accurate um, muskets and because of ammunition shortages and whatnot were frequently placed in positions where they needed to uh, aggressively maneuver and or utilize shock to their advantage and they did so with a plum and they got good at it you know especially hooker especially sorry not hooker um especially lee you know you take a look at the historic chancellorsville uh and that's just it's just ballsy maneuver i mean chancellorsville and second bull run are both examples of incredibly ballsy maneuver on the confederates parts so that's where we get i think i think this perception of um, 
Confederate super soldiers. Statistically speaking, they had worse weapons. They weren't better trained in musketry. They didn't have as much ammunition. The Union had functionally infinite um, access to weapons and muskets and bullets and everything else. The Confederacy didn't, and that forced them to behave in a manner that let them use, or not let them, but forced them to use shock as a battlefield tactic. And in a very Clausewitzian manner, they became masters at it. They became really, really, really very good at that. And where the performance differential probably starts to show up is the willingness of Union units to launch into a charge versus the willingness of Confederate units to do so. Um, because when the Union did it, it was effective. Take a look at Joseph Chamberlain, 22nd Maine, Little Round Top. He was out of bullets. No bullets, or very few bullets. So what does he do? Fix bayonets and charge. What happens? The Confederate line folds. Historically, if that happened, that was the case. Like, that was generally what happened. Um, So I think the logistical situation forced the Confederates to get really, really good at maneuver. And this is high-level spitballing on my part. Um, We're running up at the end of the battle here. I'm going to go ahead and charge Terry and take him out. And I have... um, commentary I recorded the day of when I go through the camp screen because I wanted my impressions of the camp screen and how you would try to design an army. I wanted that to be fresh and in the moment. So I turned the mic back on. Um, So I'm going to go ahead and hand the mic back to myself on the day of. This is Fiasco signing out. Holy shit. So there we have uh, Take the Fort. You know, there's the tutorial battle. Um, The first camp screen is probably one of the most important um, because it kind of sets the tone for how you're going to approach the battle or the rest of the campaign. Um, That went probably as well as it could have we managed to seize the supply wagon and took pretty minimal losses. We, we, we took losses, don't get me wrong. Uh, but yeah, that wasn't that bad. I mean, I've, I've walked away from this thing with like a couple hundred dudes. <laughs> so yeah. Um, let's take a look at uh, rebel fiasco. So he wasn't Colonel going into this battle and he gets promoted to brigadier general. Um, I could have sworn it should have been Major General, uh, but maybe I'm misremembering. Uh, Well, and that was the vanilla game. This is a different game. So let's take a look at what the perks are. Steady Under Fire gives a 25% bonus to accuracy across the entire core. Certainly useful, especially in a game that involves a lot of shooting. Um, Leads from the front, charge damage. Yeah, we saw saw the efficacy of melee damage. Um... So, yeah, I mean, the, the musketry was so laughably ineffective um, in that battle, and then the, the the melee was just through the roof. But I get the impression that's probably not going to be the case throughout the entire campaign, so let's go ahead and hold off on that for the time being. Uh, lives in the saddle, however, uh, gives 25% speed across the entire core. That's huge. Um, you saw, speaking of laughably, laughably bad, so the musketry was atrocious. The marching was also atrocious. I'm sure you saw me plenty of times lose my patience and tell them to run even though they didn't need to. So I'm going to click on that, and I imagine that will continue to pay dividends throughout the entire campaign. Um, it's the same kind of perk I, I chose all the time in... Uh, the vanilla game, I, I I view very heavily the prospect of being able to march quickly and seize terrain, um, march quickly and seize tactically significant terrain early on on a regular basis. Uh, so hopefully that will pay dividends. Uh, let me take a look. So we have 
The next point would gain an additional 3% of golden recruits. The next point would apply a deeper discount on our things. We get a pretty healthy trickle back. We would get a discount on vets and or and an additional bonus to recruit stats. So training is going to be fairly important, I think. Uh, well, they're all they're all fairly important. Um, so the bump from AO1 right now, we have one core, one division, and four brigades that can be 1750 in size. The bump up to two will give us two divisions with four brigades per division and 2,000 men to the brigade, or uh, each brigade. Now that's important because, uh, well, let's, what's the report say? Uh, defeat, you have enough supplies, okay. Blah, 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 best troops, crap. So the training goes up a bit. Um, but then they get extra recruits. So their training probably goes down or stays the same. That's okay, I guess. Um, what was I doing? Yes. So in Newport News, uh, in the vanilla game, you have three units. And in the modded game, you have four units. The rationale for that is uh, that we can't detach skirmishers. So they're giving us extra slots to take into account our desire, theoretically, to have skirmishers. Um, additionally, if you would normally have four units at first bull run, guess what? You've got five. Um, so we need to grow to be able to accommodate for five units in our divisions. Um, which means obviously that we need to go to AO two, but we don't need to do it just yet probably can take a look at econ or trickle back i don't know um logistics gives us more yes yeah, so this is what i was talking about each additional point of logistics gives you some additional ammo in the game um but it also increases the amount of weapons that are existent in the shop which is to say the armory um and it's there's one multiplier for like muskets and carbines and swords and all that kind of stuff, and then a obviously a smaller multiplier for uh, artillery, which you know, duh, that makes sense. Um, so we have cable. Cable's perk is horse artillery, plus twenty five percent speed and rotational speed. Okay, um, this is interesting because when I, I I did a test game. Um, in the version 1.23 of the uh, of the rebalance mod, and I got entirely different perks: marching drill, marching drill. So I got one of each. I got one of marching drill, and then one of the other one. Um, who's our, who do we have? Do any officers? No, we're blank on officers. So let's take a look at. Uh, yeah, the the cost of the muskets is quite a bit higher. It's very expensive to think about equipping units so we're gonna have to take a look and probably buy the um 1841 musket and and have that be our uh our the lion's share of our weapons mm. mm -hmm -hmm. recon four can stay there for the time being additional points in recon would grant quite a bit of spotting to the units as well which 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 is good, you know. That's that's that's. I often wonder, like, why bother raising recon beyond this point? And now, there's a real thought process to wanting to bump up recon. Um, damn it, dude! I don't know. I think let's go with econ. We need guns, right? Yeah, that's a pretty healthy discount. So we need guns. But we're going to need all of these stats. And obviously you can't max everything. You can come close, but you can't max everything. So we'll see. We'll see how far I can get without using politics. Uh, because the remainder are all useful. And this is just more dudes and money. And I, if I do this right, I think we're not going to need to worry too much about dudes or money. So fingers crossed, we should be okay. Um, the next thing I'd like to do, if I can get away with it, is steal one of these kernels to create the fourth unit. Let's take a look at, so the, wow, that's a different gun. The MJNG 
based on the M4 rifle musket, it provides increased accuracy and range, short range, uh, damage multiplier. So the damage range, there's been much like commu- communication on comments and everything else about how exactly do we calculate like the damage ranges or what what the hell does it mean when a gun is like why, why how do you how do you know if a gun's good or bad? And uh, Panda Kraut has been doing a lot of work and trying to communicate to the player, you know, which guns are useful. Um, and I think that this is a really great change that he's done to the tooltip. Uh, it looks quite a bit different. Um, and so my understanding is that every time a unit fires, it can do between 2.55 and 3.9 in this particular instance uh, points of damage. And then that's I, I, probably per musket, I'm imagining. Um, every the, the way that accuracy in this game works is every single shot is 100% accurate, but it is possible with debuff modifiers and everything to do zero damage uh, between cover and all the other other cover and you know, everything else, uphill, downhill, <clears throat> unit accuracy and everything else. You can do between 2.55 and 3.9 damage, irrespective apparently of accuracy of the actual unit itself. Um, and then that range, whatever the dice roll is between those two values, is then multiplied by um, this range damage multiplier, I guess. So it's 100% accurate, but it's got debuffs applied vis-a-vis distance and everything else. So you can see that the 1841 MJNG starts off, it needs, like to be useful, it needs to be point-blank range, 74%. Even at the best possible circumstances, 3.9, you're already suffering a 25%, 26% penalty because just the weapon accuracy or whatever, um, it's not reliable or something. The drop-off to its medium range, which I'm presuming if there's, a, it's a 400 range on the gun, I presume you can expect that 0 to 100 is short range, 100 to 200 is medium range, 2 to 3 is long, and 3 plus is is max range but that's honestly a shot in the dark guess it seems logical but who knows um so the drop off is fairly linear uh no it's not it it honestly this is a pretty good weapon like it's really good up close as you can see um but the drop off between medium range and long range isn't all that bad so this thing retains its efficacy out to max range although obviously it's better up close let's compare that against something that we know is going to have shit drop off uh let's take a look at the musket yeah so um comparison 74 percent at point blank range down to 41 so you're losing 33 percent of your accuracy off of your range take a look at the musket huge damage by comparison 2.55 to 3.9 okay musket 2.7 to 5.7 so at close range at like point blank, really close range, the musket and the MJNG are indistinguishable. Um, you got a higher damage cap, but even at the maximum range, you're going to have lower damage dealt because the damage range multiplier is smaller still. Um, the percussion musket is but look at the drop off at long range sorry i got i got distracted the drop off at long range 41% effective at long range with the musket 18% damage multiplier on whatever you roll so if you roll 2.7 multiply that by 0.18 that's a huge drop in terms of accuracy Never mind the fact that the effective range of the muskets is 300 versus the rifle's 400. So let's take like a really good high end. Yeah, the Whitworth, for example. Uh, damage range is much much higher. So 2.55 2. to 3.9. So basically 2.5 to 4. And then you got 4.5 to 6.5. So it's an order of magnitude. It's a shift higher. It's already an order of magnitude higher. It's got the same range. Now, interestingly, you look at the accuracy drop-off, 74 down to 41. The accuracy drop-off isn't that much different, 75 down to 48. But the middle range is just kind of where the Whitworth seems to shine. The drop-off to medium range is 60 to 53, and you have 53 to 46. So um, at 
the 300 meter range, I'm, I'm assuming it's meters, but who knows, the 300 meter range, give or take, this weapon is performing as well as the MJ and G is performing at close range, and 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 all of that is being modified by the fact that the effect, the damage range is an order of magnitude higher uh, than the MG. So I'm going to be honest with you, I don't completely understand um, all the math that goes into this and, and kind of how it, how things behave differently in the rebalance mod than they do uh, in the vanilla game. I'm sure that the general concepts, concept, concepts are the same. I'm sure that the Enfield and the Lorenz are going to be great mid-game rifles, and we'll have to figure out kind of what to make of the rest of it. But there does appear to be a um, rework in terms of the balance model for what guns are available. We've got Springfield 55s as the game begins. We've got Harper's Ferries as the game begins. Along the Springfield 61 isn't all that far behind. It looks like this, the the uh, 55 so I'm going to figure out what's available and, and when and when I should be considering what rifle or whatever. We'll figure it out. But um, these are both shock units. These are both maneuver units. And I think you noticed they have just atrocious, laughably bad um, musketry. Now, we want to steal... Let's see, can a light colonel run this and not? Yeah, barely. So we can use Brandon Douglas to run Douglas's brigade, which will ultimately be second infantry. And then we can spawn another infantry using Kemper here. Uh, and we'll go ahead. Oh, wait, I already said what I wanted to have him do. So I need to do something first. Do, do. The 41. The reason I'm using the 41. Uh, it has the same general stats as the MG, I'm guessing. Yeah. So the MG and G is just an upgraded 41. Blah, 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 ballistics. Okay, whatever. The important stat that I care about right now is melee 85. Take a look at the Springfield 1855. This is clearly a shooting gun. Melee 60. Now what's the drop-off look like? I don't know. Oh, geez. 2.6 to 3.9, so the damage curve is more or less the same. More, It's functionally, who cares, it's the same, whatever. But the drop-off is bad. 69 all the way down to 20. This isn't much better than a musket, right? I mean, yeah, longer range, okay, fine. But this isn't much better than a musket. Shit. 2.5 to 4. 2.5 to 4. Range 400. Range 400. 69 to 20. 67 to 20. Why in the shit am I paying $5 more for... What am I missing? Fire rate 125. Fire rate 100. Okay. That's probably what the differential comes from. These, in terms of performance characteristics, they're not that far off from each other. Uh, which is interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. But... You've got a faster fire rate on the 25. So that might that might actually be useful on a on a uh on a shock unit then. And as long as I turn this eventually with the second perk if I get one, let's 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 do the thing I was doing before. Um So what's my shooting gun? What's the gun that's supposed to be good for shooting right now? Crap. Crap. I need something I can use at long range. It looks like the 41 is it. I mean, I don't have enough Lorenzas to use, right? No, I don't. Harper's Ferry is a good gun. Nice higher damage curve. Good rate of fire. Nice long range drop off. Alright, yeah, so it looks like the 41 is is your shooter gun and then the rebore well the springfield is your close range weapon but i don't 
I don't have the money to buy a bunch of spring fields right now. So let's build Kemper. Yep. Okay. And he's got a 41. Boom. Boom. Yes. Okay, good. We can get him a perk. So at first you get two choices. We've seen um, marching drill, 25 speed. So with the core perk, that's 50% speed bonus. They're going to be pretty quick, especially considering how bad everything else was, plus charge damage. All right. Alternative, double the accuracy, minus 10% reload time. Good Lord. But we have the opportunity now. Let's take a look at what else is coming up. Uh, bayonet proficiency, minus 15% melee damage morale received so they can fight longer sounds like basically uh additional speed again so between everything else that'd be a plus 75 percent speed plus 50 percent charge damage so if you do these things together that's double charge damage so jesus these guys are going to be assault marines maneuver proficiency 25 percent speed again okay so speed 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 plus 500% rotational speed. I don't know if we really had a chance to show this off in the tutorial, but the units rotated slower. Um, and then minus 20% reload time. So there's, and then uh, musketry proficiency, accuracy, reload time, fire, damage, morale received. So you're seeing now there's three kind of ways you can go um, with your units. Uh I don't know if I like this perk. Speed and damage. I mean, speed and charge damage. I don't know. Accuracy is so much better. Accuracy, reload time. I kind of, I, I don't know. I can see the value of Grenadier units that just go balls deep on melee. Let's, what's the third tier? Elite. Plus 25 speed again. So let me see. 25 from the core. 25 here, that's 50, 75. So double speed, Jesus Christ. Uh, okay, double speed, reload time reduction, minus 15% melee damage morale received, minus 10% fire damage morale received. So they'll just, they'll just tank anything. We'll tank it on the way in because they're going to get minus 15% melee here as well. So they'll just uh, accept some, they're just going to, they're going to fight longer. That's awesome. Uh, and then sharpshooter. So you can go like, I want to stand in the far back and snipe from far away. You just go full right tree. If you go either, I, I would say this is probably better. And then this one's good. If you want someone to get right up in their grill and trade blows at very close range. So this could be a unit that would be good for, for flanking. Uh, and yet, honestly, uh, this is probably okay for that too. Um, because when you're that close, you don't need as much um, the accuracy. So Douglas, let's say Douglas picks up his star. Um, I might go with the middle perk for Douglas because this is a high rate of fire weapon, fire rate 125, but it's not super long range. So I want to be right up close on someone's flank. So he's a flanker. This guy's going to be my long range, you know, sharpshooter. And then I guess we'll make Siegfried the Space Marine because, like, I don't know, Imperial Fist or whatever. Uh, so boom, accuracy penalty or accuracy bonus. Um, so we want you shooting stuff from far away and there's a morale debuff. Why is that? And why is it red? Why do I see red? Probably because I don't know. Um, reasons. Sure. Okay. So. Hmm. That's actually a great perk. Double speed, uh, well, plus 125 speed, and rotational speed. But it's not good on the ordnance at all. Like, this is a rifled gun. And it says fast reload and exceptional accuracy, but dude, the numbers here don't bear it out. Look at this. Underneath 100, so within close range, so let's call that canister, there's a 32% damage debuff on top of those those die rolls between 33 and 45 out to one freaking percent at long range. This is a, like I, if it's possible, I dislike this gun even more in the rebalance mod than I do <clears throat> in uh, the base game, the vanilla game. 
but what do I replace it with? I don't have anything else. The only other option is a six pound field. Um, <clears throat> yes, sir. Oh, I hate to do this. Well, the officers will be sent back to the barracks. Let's try something. I know I can't make units smaller, which is a shame, but I do have a colonel. So theoretically speaking, it should allow me to, because I don't, let's try this. Oh God, <laughs> I hope this doesn't go wrong. All right, Cable, I'm disbanding you. Cable, come back. Actually, yeah, be the six pounder. He's no perks. Why not? He's just not good enough? Okay. Kemper's a better colonel. Preston's an even better colonel still. Boom. All right, cool. So that was a little tricky, but we got it. And now we can take a look at the artillery perks. So the artillery perk options, long range focus plus 50% accuracy and effective range. That's super cool. Short range focus minus 50% reload time or and accuracy. All right, I, I can see that. Um, and then there's the one we've already seen, horse artillery. So very fast and rotational speed useful. Um, I'm going to do this one. And the, the rationale, the thought process is that I'm going to, this is going to be an infantry support battery. So we'll do that. Uh, let's take a look at what else we got. Tactical training, cover, reload time, cool. Uh, accuracy, shot, shell damage, mid-range focus. Yep, that makes sense. Extreme range focus, accuracy, and effective range. So this is going to be something you take a look at for counter-battery work. We, we just don't have access to those kind of guns and those kind of numbers yet. Um, Rapid-fire specialist. Oh, yeah bombardment specialist so we're gonna we're gonna take this down the left track here i think and they're gonna be our our flying flying battery uh i guess it doesn't really matter huh right no nine okay that's how many six pounders i currently have so we're gonna take these into newport we got camper our shooter man we got Douglas, who will go ahead and bump up with the 168 um, Springfields we've currently got access to. Boom. We got Siegfried, the Space Marine. So. Now we're Grenadiers, I guess. First Grenadiers. Okay. Do they get the MG? Seems like a pretty good gun for 41. What's the drop off? That's well, two and a half to four. 74 to 41. What's the damage range here? 2.4 to. Okay, I should swap these out. The Grenadiers get the 41. Yeah. And the Shooters get the MG. Can I afford to make it bigger? Yeah. How? Wait. Well, look at this. Two. How did that number get bigger? <laughs> what is? We're all exp okay. I guess this is just we get to like learn this together. Um, let's go ahead and give them all 171. Newport News is a bit of a slog. It's a tough battle, so we're gonna need every do we got. Boom. Okay. Grenadiers. They're a melee unit. Uh, let's push them up to 1250. Let's, that's going to be our standard, I think. Yes, sir. 1250 is what we're going to try and get to. He says, says while raising a unit larger than this. So assault marines or assault confederates. Um, you're a third unit. You're a rifled unit because you're going to be long range. And then the generalist, the line infantry. For the, the guys who 
We're going to we're going to have at least one unit of all three cuz I want to see them all perform. But super long range, like these are going to be our long range sniper dudes. Um they're going to go middle tier, so I guess I can't pull it up, but they're still going to go marching drill and then they're going to go that middle tier of the three and then I don't know, we'll figure out whatever the third one is when they get the three three stars comma if they ever do. Um but the objective with second line and and units like this is they're going to be either trying to flank or trying to side uh like get get up in the shit basically um and then the grenadiers are going to be you know smack dab in the middle of everything um oh and then uh you're an infantry support gun i can't infantry go shoots there you go infantry support gun that's not anything that matters uh no, I need to, like, know what you do. Sure. I'll figure something out. That'll work. Um, boom, 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 boom. Oh, that's going to bug me. There. There. Okay, now I'm happy. I see no reason to spend reputation on the percussion musket. We're going to get plenty in the course of the next battles. And what's it cost to buy one of you? $30. No way. Not yet. Jesus. And then, um, I mo in my test game, I made a sniper unit, uh, for bull run and they were okay. Um, but I kind of want to see like a cav, like a melee cav, uh, or, you know, whatever, one kind of cav or the other. Anyway, um, this is what we got for Newport news. We'll, we'll talk about it in camp, uh, for first bull run. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next episode. But this is, until then, this is Fiasco. I'm uh, really excited to see where all this goes. And I will see you guys in the next one. Fiasco, signing out.